Did feeding your babies turn out to be harder than you expected for longer than you expected? It did for my guest Lex Beach's first babies as well, who are a set of twins. She came into parenthood fully ready and wanting to be a parent, having read parenting magazines since the time she was a young child. Yet it was still way more difficult than she ever thought it could be. And she discusses the ways in which that really threw her off guard and her thought processes along the way as she weighed her options and how she decided to continue going despite the difficulty. And this is just part one of her story because Lex has seven total children and fed five of them with her own body. This week, you get to hear Lex's story of feeding her twins, which she did over 20 years ago. And then next week, come back to tune in to part two of her story, where we get to hear her evolution as her feelings about nursing evolved and formed more nuance. So definitely come back next week to hear the rest of her story. When I began breastfeeding, I was blindsided by how difficult it was, having known only a handful of people who had ever done it and only seeing it up close a couple of times. I had a huge learning curve. Since then, I've become a doula, a childbirth educator, and an internationally board certified lactation consultant, or an IBCLC. I'm your host, Lo Nigrosh, and I welcome you to the Milk Making Minutes, where we explore the systemic medical and cultural barriers that make feeding our babies so difficult so that you know your baby feeding struggles are not your fault and your triumphs really are the miracles you feel they are. Hi, Lex. Welcome to the Milk Making Minutes. I'm so glad you're here. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah. So um, before we hit start recording, well, actually, in our last couple of conversations, I have mentioned to you that you are somebody that I have admired, mostly from afar, for many years, (laughs) as I have um, worked hard to get my IBCLC credentials. And so I am so glad to finally have you on the podcast. So thank you so much for taking time out of your busy life to be here. Oh, I'm delighted to be here. And I only just found out about your podcast um, once we connected and I've listened to a lot of episodes. So oh, I feel I'm so glad pretty to hear it. well caught up and it's been a joy to listen to. Oh, great. Yeah. So before we get into your all of your stories or the stories you want to focus on, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your life, your family? Sure. Yeah. So um, I have seven children and I live with them (laughs) and my wife, Meg. We live in Greenfield, Massachusetts, and we also have two dogs and two giant house rabbits and two baby lambs. Um, We we have a full home situation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I work as a lactation consultant as an IBCLC at a freestanding birth center. Um, and I have been a lactation consultant for, uh, I always do it by counting backwards from how old my kids are. So I guess it's been like 12 years or 13 years since I became certified. Um, and before that, I was a CLC. And before that, I was a La Leche League leader. So I've been doing the work of helping people make milk and feed their babies for uh, almost 19 years altogether. Yeah, it's incredible. It's amazing when you count back um, from even before the the credential of IBCLC right. because yeah. it takes so long to get it that it does. <laughs> when you when you add on those extra years and you think, wow, you know, you've been doing this work for so long. Yeah. I, I guess I've really, um, you know, dedicated my life to it yeah. accidentally, but it's a huge yeah. passion. So it feels yeah. really lucky. Yeah, that's fantastic. Okay. So um, I would love to know before you had your children, what your exposure was to human milk making, baby feeding, yeah. what your thoughts were about it before it was your turn. 
Yeah, I love that you ask that question because that's always what I ask everyone when I meet with them prenatally for the first Mm. time. And that's because um, feeding of all kinds is a learned social behavior. And that's how humans learn how to feed their babies and how to feed themselves. Um, It's why it's so cultural. I think I came out ahead of most people growing up in the U.S. in that I was exposed to babies a lot in that I was always loved babies. And so the same way I was thinking about this, like this morning I had to drive my son to school so far away. So I was in the car for an hour and I have no idea like how many tractor trailers I passed or backhoes or excavators. But I know that when some of my children were little, they would have like been able to report that to you right now, (laughs) you know, because that's what they were interested in. And so for me, from when I was really practically a baby myself, I was interested in babies. So what babies did exist in my life, I noticed. So I think I noticed babies and baby feeding probably every chance I got. Knew from very early on that whatever my career would be, would be something having to do with babies. My parents got me a subscription to Parents Magazine when I was like 10. Um, Oh my goodness. Yeah. So I had read like all of the parenting books, Dr. Spock, um, Dr. Sears, Penelope Leach, all of those as like a young teenager. I don't have like a good explanation. I think I was just a really big dork, but I liked babies and was fascinated by this whole idea of parenting and what you know, the trends were. So I, my early exposure was pretty mainstream. Parents Magazine, I now know is like this very, I don't know if it still exists, but it was very like a mainstream. I'm sure there, there was reference to breastfeeding and human milk. I also read Spiritual Midwifery when I was young, decided I wanted to be a midwife. So I remember as a teenager knowing that I wanted to have babies and breastfeed them like imagining doing that, even though I I don't know that I saw it that much. Like I was a babysitter a lot and I fed the baby's bottles. I don't really remember seeing people nurse their babies. My mom had nursed me and my sisters and she talked about that as like a great thing and also just sort of an easy, simple thing, which would Mm. come up later in my story. But it was like, she talks about breastfeeding and like she exclusively breastfed. And then there would also be mentions of like my sister reacting to formula. And I'm like, well, so which one was it, mom? (laughs) Not that it really matters. But, you know, I think what did breastfeeding mean to her was maybe different than what it meant to me, ultimately. Um, But the best exposures I got were once I was in college, I was babysitting a lot locally. And the babies I was babysitting for then were breastfed. And a lot of them were breastfeeding toddlers, which was probably my first time getting exposed to that idea of like nursing beyond infancy. And other things like carrying babies in slings and families sleeping with their babies in their bed and not having a crib. Those were brand new ideas to me in college that I definitely got hooked on as like, oh, that's a thing. At that point, I didn't read Parents Magazine anymore. I read Mothering Magazine, which was Mm. a more natural family living sort of approach. Um, A lot of talk of attachment parenting. Yeah, probably it was this one family. I was their after school nanny for a couple of years in college. They had three kids. The youngest was a baby when I started. And they just, you know, being with them, they were so great. And I was like, I just want to have a baby and do it just like this family does. Mm. And I remember when the older kids first told me that the baby slept in their parents' bed, like, I thought they were joking. Like, I was like, oh, wow. Like, that's not a thing. Like, you don't sleep with your baby in your bed and not like for any safety issue. Like, that also wasn't really a thing in the late 1990s. Right. Um, It was just sort of like, that's weird. Uh And 
Like, right. what does that do Beds to the parents' intimacy? For, like, right. yeah. <laughs> babies, right. Babies should, like, you need your privacy if you're a grown up, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that definitely is probably why I ended up being successful with um, breastfeeding my twin babies, even though I really didn't know anything about breastfeeding in like um, a practical sense or, and my birth was, went really poorly. So I, mm-hmm. I was not set up for success, I would say, mm-hmm. um, aside mm-hmm. from having had this beautiful immersion into these families who were kind of living the way I wanted to live. Did you ever see any struggle at all from any of them? With breastfeeding? Yeah. Um, or baby No, I, I remember one baby I was taking care of who was quite small, like a newborn, and her mom was struggling to get her to take a bottle. Mm -hmm. And the mom was really distressed about that. And that was like part of my job when I would babysit would be trying to get the baby to take a bottle. But I Mm -hmm. didn't, there wasn't an associated um, like breastfeeding, you know, direct feeding struggle. Mm -hmm. Okay. There. And I remember my aunt, I I have cousins who are, this one is probably like 12 or 13 years younger than I am. And she was breastfeeding my cousin. And she said, like, every time she had to feed him, she had to, like, go sit on the toilet and, like, use the boppy and, like, have her snacks and her waters because she couldn't get up once she started. So, mm. like, if she had to pee, she needed to, like, already be on the toilet and, like, oh have her God. snacks and water. And I was like, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I think I just sort of thought, like, that was her being nutty. Of course, that's not sustainable. <laughs> right. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't like a just everywhere you are, you nurse your baby kind of a thing until mm-hmm. I was in college and I saw those older babies nursing in that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so then when you, you mentioned wanting to be a midwife, so when you started college, was that the track that you were taking? Well, or- I went to um, a liberal arts college, so it wasn't like I could learn to be a midwife there exactly, right. but I was pretty sure that there was nothing I could do in college towards that. So it was sort of like just going to be a background education thing that my family really wanted me to get my bachelor's degree. And I threatened to drop out a lot along the way, but I made it through. And part of what I made it through about was like everyone in my life was like, just graduate from college and then you can have a baby. And I had decided. Oh, so you just wanted a baby. I just really? wanted a baby. Well, I uh-huh. wanted to be a midwife. And I was like, but you can't be a midwife until you've gone through it. Like, oh. I wouldn't trust a midwife who hadn't gone through it, was what I thought at the time. Uh huh. It wasn't really well thought out because it turns out that once I had a baby, um, I was like, how would I go to midwifery school now? Like, <laughs> where, how would I go be on call for 24 hours or longer for a birth? That's crazy. So yeah, the midwifery dream didn't last long um, after after motherhood. Okay. Okay. But, All right. But yeah, I did get... Um, so I was married. I wasn't actually married. This was before marriage was legal, but I was gay and I was had a partner. Um, I was 22. So I literally, I graduated from college, turned 22 and got pregnant like within the course of a few weeks. Wow. Yeah. And people were like, couldn't believe that I would do that intentionally at that time. And obviously it wasn't an accident because I was partnered to a woman. Um, But it was, I had been charting my cycle in preparation for this and my cycle was kind of all over the place. So I went to see an OB, um, which is funny since I wanted a home birth, but I I went to see an OB just for, you know, a check-in about my cycles. And she immediately was like, well, yeah, you are just going to have to take Clomid. And I was like, okay. So I did. And I got pregnant right away with twins. So that's what happened. Okay. You probably know by now that my number one goal is to reduce stress in the perinatal period. 
So I am so pleased to announce my new partnership with Feast and Fettle, which is a locally prepared home delivery meal service. I was able to select from a list of delicious meal options that got delivered right to my front door for the entire week. Some of the options I chose were zucchini lasagna, roasted carrots, some challah bread, some pork fried rice. Those are just a few of the choices that we had that we devoured. I highly recommend this service as one way to just get one more thing off your plate so that you can spend more time focusing on your family and less time worrying about all the things that you need to do. Just go to feastandfettle.com, which will be linked in the show notes. And if you use my code MILK, M-I-L-K, you can get $30 off your first week. Let Feast and Fettle do the cooking for you. If you want to have less anxiety and more confidence so that your parenting journey can feel like you always wanted it to feel, then go to my website right now so that you can have a person by your side who not only knows how you feel, but who combines my expertise of lactation with your expertise of your body and your baby to help you make the next right step in your lactation journey, because that's all you really need to do is make the next right step. And right now, that next right step is going to my website, www.quabinbirthservices.com. And I can't wait to see your name pop up in my inbox or on my phone, on my text messages. Talk to you soon. All right. So you mentioned that you had uh, a difficult birth. So um, tell me a little bit about how the birth impacted your early feeding struggles, knowing all that you know now, even though you didn't know it then. Yeah. Um, Yeah. I just, I knew nothing. I, I would love to go back and watch now all the insane things that happened. But so at the time, the twins were born in early 2003 and they were born by C-section. They were both breech. So it was a scheduled C-section at 38 weeks. And I had been told that the standard policy at that time was after the babies are out, like they would show them to me and then they would take them to the nursery. And that was just still standard. I don't think that is standard, certainly not around here anymore babies stay in the room. But um, that was a really scary idea to me um, when I was pregnant that like they would, I just come out of me and then be gone. Um, But there wasn't any wiggle room there. That was just like, that's what's going to happen. And my partner could go with them. And then right before the surgery, like literally like I was getting prepped for surgery. I said, but don't give them a bath. I don't want them to have a bath. I want to be there for the bath. And that was my reasoning. Like, I just didn't want to miss anything. I didn't know that, like, we shouldn't bathe babies right away. It wasn't, like, that smart of an idea. It was just that. And then it turned out that because I didn't want them to have a bath, there was no reason for them to go to the nursery. Like, that was the whole point of why they were going to take them. Oh my gosh, my jaw just dropped. (laughs) For anyone who's listening and not watching, my jaw just dropped. Yeah. And I remember the nurse said to me like, well, they'll be really gross. And I said, I don't think, like, I'll be fine with it. (laughs) Like, And they're like, okay, well, then we're not going to take them. And I was like, are you kidding? Like, I have fought for that. And no one ever said it was because of the bath. Anyway. Oh my gosh. That's Unfortunately, insane. so I had an epidural for the C-section, which is also not really a thing for a scheduled C-section, but uh, that's what I had instead of a spinal because right beforehand they asked me which one I wanted and they told me there was like a risk of a spinal headache if I had a spinal that was higher than an epidural. So I was like, okay, then I'll have the epidural. An epidural is not a great choice for a C-section um, unless you already have one from laboring. It's um, just not as you know, people talk about their epidurals failing and stuff like that, which it took about 45 minutes for my epidural to work. Like they kept, you know, poking my belly and I'd be like, yep, I still feel that. I still feel that. Mm. 
And then after the babies were out during the surgery, the epidural failed. Uh, So that was very traumatic and painful. Mm. And the solution was to give me a whole lot more drugs. So it turns out, even though the babies were in the room with me, I was so drugged, I, I probably wouldn't have noticed really if they hadn't been with me. Um, and they gave you drugs intravenously? Yeah, or? I think they just like gave me as much as, like I was awake, but like my eyes were barely open. Mm. Um, it made me start vomiting. So I'm like vomiting and totally out of it. And yes, there were two babies, but I didn't feel like they were my babies. Mm. I didn't feel like, you know, I remember thinking like, oh, everyone is going to be there. Both of our parents were there and they're all going to want to hold the babies, but I'm going to want to hold the babies. And in reality, I was like, I don't care about holding the babies. Like Mm. someone should hold the babies. They're crying. (laughs) Um, it, so it and, just created this really disconnecting experience. Oh, it was totally disconnected. And they were like completely swaddled up. Like what I saw of them were, you know, heads, some round faces. Cheeks. Right. And yeah, that's it. Like they had hats. They were burritoed. Um, it actually was six weeks until I held them skin to skin against my body. Because skin to skin was not a thing we knew about. And... It was six weeks until I could was cleared to take a bath and I decided to take a bath with them. And that was like the first time I ever held them skin to skin. And it was incredibly healing at that point. One of them I just felt so detached from, especially, and I felt so guilty that I was like more attached to his brother. And then like holding them skin to skin in the bath, I was like, oh, you are my babies. Like it was magic. Even six weeks later, which is a great message I give yes. to my clients all the time. It's not like the benefits of skin to skin ever expire. No, never. It's always a magical reset. But yeah, it's pretty devastating to me now that it was that long before I ever got that. They yeah. were just dressed and swaddled and had hats on. And it is a miracle that breastfeeding worked out as well as it did. So, yeah, I spent the whole first day postpartum still vomiting all day. I nursed them. We had decided when I was pregnant that I would just nurse them. I wasn't going to pump or use bottles. Pumping wasn't so much of a thing, even though this is only 20 years ago. Um, It certainly wasn't. You weren't getting a pump for free from your insurance, and we had no money. So why was I going to go buy a thing that when I was going to be home? with the babies. And I had read something about like, you know, that the point of bottle feeding would really be for the benefit of the father or (laughs) the other parent in our case, like, so that that person can bond with the baby, but there are other ways to bond with the baby and that, you know, you should just let the breastfeeding parent nurse. And so we were like, okay, that's what we're going to do. And that also probably was really helpful because I think if I had been pumping at that point, it it would have messed with things in a different way. It would have probably added to your stress at that point too. Yeah, because like nothing would have come out. And right. Yeah. Just all the... Yeah, it's one of those... A pump is a tricky tool. Like so, so helpful. Saving grace sometimes. Mm-hmm. And also an intervention that messes right. with things. Right. And other times. But right. yeah, I... Um, Luckily, I had, even though the babies were 38 weeks, one was eight and a half pounds, which is big wow. for a 38-week twin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, the other one was six pounds, four ounces. So he was a more regular size twin, um, tiny guy. Um, but they were not sleepy. They were not the sleepy kind of 38-weekers. They wanted to eat all the time, and that was really helpful. And I think knowing nothing also was helpful in that I was just like, okay, I'll feed them. Like I didn't have any preconceived idea about they should only eat every few hours or anything like that. It was just, well, I'll just keep feeding them (laughs) Mm -hmm. if that's what they want. And Mm -hmm. so um, I remember really liking breastfeeding a lot. And I posted on, I was in like an online forum for Mothering Magazine that was called mothering.commune. It was really great. 
I learned so much there. <laughs> but I posted saying like, my twins are here. I'm breastfeeding them. I love breastfeeding so much, even though my nipples are blistered and bleeding. <laughs> and someone responded and was like, that's not normal. Like <laughs> they, they shouldn't be blistered and bleeding. Um, but it wasn't upsetting me. There was a lactation consultant at the hospital. I asked from the first day, I was like, I know I'm supposed to say I want to see the lactation consultant. I had just had twins. I was 22 years old. I would think I would be a priority for right. the lactation consultant, but no. Yeah. So I, on like the very last day, she, I remember her like popping her head in the door, like maybe not even coming all the way into the room. And I was like, ah, I've got these blisters. And she was like, I heard the babies have each gained an ounce. And I was like, okay. She was like, so everything's great. Oh my God. <laughs> she yeah. told you everything was great. Yeah. <laughs> Because, you know, I guess they had each gained an ounce from after, you know, losing 10%. I think they both lost 10%. And so I was discharged. It was That was another one of those things where they were like, well, you could stay three nights or you could stay four nights. But if you leave after three nights, you get a postpartum doula, 24 hours of a postpartum doula who would come six times for four-hour chunks. That was like a thing. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, I think the program shut down a couple years after that. But... Um, I was like, okay, well, I don't know what we should do. And then they were like, actually, you should leave. <laughs> you know, it's one of those, like, it's not really a choice. You're kicked out. <laughs> they thought uh, you would jump on that postpartum. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you know, it was good to go home uh, yeah. in some ways, except for that that was the night my milk really came in and I got really engorged. And my breasts were so full and hard that the babies couldn't latch mm. on and... All along, like my nipples were really flat before I had the baby, the first babies. I don't know why I wasn't given a nipple shield. That's another miracle. Like that was a thing then to just toss the, out nipple shields willy nilly. Right. As she poked her head in the door. Here, yeah. take one of these. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I didn't even know a nipple shield existed. I, right. I didn't learn about that until later um, when I had friends who were using them. But like it was hard to get the babies to latch. Like it, it took like nurses pinching my breasts and... Mm -hmm. forcing heads on. And Mm -hmm. um, by the time I went home, I was tandem nursing. And I know I've I've listened to the other twin podcasts you've done. And it can be like, you should tandem nurse or actually that's kind of complicated. And for me, it, it was just a matter of necessity. The babies nursed so much that there was no way not to tandem nurse. They were nursing for like at least 45 minutes of every two hour chunk of time. So Like literally, I would have only been nursing and like someone would have been holding a fussy baby if I hadn't been tandem nursing. So I was doing that, but that first night was very rough um, because I was so engorged. They weren't nursing. It just felt terrible. I remember feeling like this is impossible. Like I can't do this. And I hadn't imagine that that was a way I could ever feel. I thought it was like, if you decide to breastfeed, you breastfeed. And if you decide not to, then you don't. But like, if you decide to, why would you not? And then I was like, I understand why you would not. (laughs) It's so hard. Yeah. (sighs) And you had wanted this your whole life. So then to have suddenly these feelings of anxiety and frustration and a feeling of inadequacy, yeah, and just Must not knowing so what to do. Yeah. yeah. And my my poor wife also, I mean, she didn't know anything about this. This had been my idea to have all these <laughs> <Yeah>. babies. Uh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I remember that first night calling the pediatrician, like emergency line at like 1230, because one of the babies had been sleeping for like four or five hours and we couldn't wake him up. And I was like, it's not fine. It's not fine. I don't know. And like, I just like couldn't even really talk. I was like crying so hard. And my wife took the phone and she was like, the baby is fine. <laughs> Everything Aww. is fine. Um, but the takeaway from that was that um, my mom who was staying with us was sent back to the hospital to get a pump to try to relieve some of the engorgement with a pump. And that was ended up being the only time I ever tried pumping um, with the twins. So my mom came home probably at like 1 a.m. I pumped some very meager amount of milk. My wife, I droppered it into that sleepy baby and 
we went on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but what happened the next day was probably the most meaningful thing in, in probably what triggered my whole career path in that the mother of those kids I had been the nanny for in college came over. She was just dropping off food. She didn't know I was on the struggle bus. Uh, but so she showed up and I'm just there with these like boulders, lumpy boulders of breasts and weeping and like, I can't do this. And she was just so calm and confident. And she came and she like got some olive oil and she's helping massage my breasts. And we have the babies there underneath, like sort of the milk is dripping into their mouths. Mm. And and she was just like, oh, these babies are going to love nursing. It is going to mm. be their favorite thing. I'm like, you are not even going to believe the places you are going to nurse these babies. You are going to nurse at the park. You are going to nurse at the grocery store. You are going to nurse on airplanes and buses and out to dinner. And she was just like talking about like all the places I was going to nurse them and how much they were going to love it. And I remember thinking... Reminding you of your why. Yeah. Not even focusing on the difficulty you were having. Exactly. Like barely even acknowledging that it was just sort of like, oh yeah, whatever. Like this Mm -hmm. is just this tiny blip of a moment. And I remember like it felt so impossible that that could be true, that I could ever do the thing she was saying. But in the weeks that followed, like those were the words that I would cling to. I'm like, Mm. yes, I want that. Um, And I think that guides me a lot in my practice as a lactation consultant of like, just being there with someone and like not getting wrapped up in this immediate moment, but like normalizing it and talking about that there is another side. Like you gonna you're gonna come through this to the other side, mm-hmm. like totally confidently. Yeah. So she she basically saved the day there, <laughs> just yeah. as a, an experienced breastfeeding mother. You know, I, I, it was very painful for me to nurse the twins. That was the main struggle we had. They always gained weight well enough. I went to breastfeeding clinics with that same lactation consultant that were free at the hospital. We really didn't have any money to consider paying out of pocket for something is how it felt at the time. Of course, now I'm like, well, wouldn't it have been so worth it? But at the time, I like couldn't even consider it. Um, and every time they would just be like, they're gaining weight. It's great. And I'd be like, but it hurts so much. Mm. Like I'm crying through so many feeds. And they'd be like, but the latch looks good. And they're gaining weight. <laughs> so I'm sure you know. This is a PSA (laughs) that I say all the time, which is the only person that can say whether a latch is good is the person who is feeling the latch. You know, we can guide and, and, and give what a latch is supposed to look like, but the only person who knows is it if it feels good is the person whose body the latch is on. Mm -hmm. Yes. This idea that gaining weight is the only measure by which we determine how things are going is ridiculous. It really is. And I, I mean, tell, it's lucky that they were. That's yeah, great. Right. I tell parents all the time, your pain matters. How you feel matters because it needs to be sustainable. And it sounds like for you, you endured that pain for a long time. My first experience, I endured pain for a long time, but I chose to do that. I decided that that was better than stopping in my situation, but I do not expect every person to do that. And I was seeking out help to try to change the situation all along the way, right? And too often, people's pain is just disregarded if their baby is doing well. Yeah. So I I had a lot, I um, had mastitis and then I took antibiotics and then I had thrush and I was doing all the things, gentium, violet, um, 
I flu can for weeks and weeks. I, I was having to, I really had to become my own lactation consultant. I had just with the internet and print out all these articles and protocols and bring them to my midwife or bring them to the lactation consultant and be like, I think this is what I need to do. Mm. And that was like kind of right, you know, right at the beginning of the 2000s. So I remember those early 2000s, like the internet was a thing, but it's not yes. like it is now where oh, you can no. just find anything. I'm sure yes. you were spending hours looking for I what was. you needed. Yeah. Although yeah. Kelly mom was, was there. Um, it was? It was. And I don't think it's really changed much. <laughs> I don't think wow. she's updated it much since the early 2000s. Yeah. So Kelly mom was, was a fantastic resource for me. Wow, um, I did not realize that that it's been around that long. Yeah, and Jack Newman's stuff was there. Yeah, of um, course. You know, hmm. and then I would read things like maybe it's not thrush, and uh, you know, I so I'd go back and forth, but like I didn't have a person to turn to who was helping me with this. It was really like, yeah, the blind bleeding myself, the blind, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and just trying to feed my babies and survive. So I I mentioned my mom had successfully breastfed. She came to help, I remember, and she couldn't believe how frequently the babies needed to nurse. You know, Mm. maybe they would be off the breast for half an hour and then they're crying again and they're coming back. And she, she said, you know, I... My doctor told me like I had to wait three hours between oh my God. yeah, or else like there wouldn't be enough milk for the baby. Like you have to take that a break. Yeah, that they have to fill up. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. And luckily, like I was like, well, I don't know if that's true. Like I think I read a different thing. Mm-hmm. But again, haven't done any research about this. And instead I was just like, well, if I don't nurse them, like they're crying. Mm-hmm. And if I nurse them, they're not crying. So I think we should just nurse them. <laughs> like, that was right. sort of like the way I made it through. Thank goodness. Way to tune into your instinct. Yeah. 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 But it was like so much nursing. So it was like, it's painful and it's just constant. And I remember other moms like with their one baby wanting to go for a walk together. And we'd like be this little a horde of new mothers with our babies. And it was like, for me to go even for a 15 minute walk was really hard because the babies were going to want to nurse and I couldn't nurse them and walk at the same time and like trying to hold them off and, and then tell everyone like, I think I have to stop and nurse. And everyone was so kind, but like, I just, I never felt like I could do like the normal things. (laughs) I also um, had this love hate relationship with my twin nursing pillow, which I literally would like buckle myself into um, and sometimes wear it for the whole day. That was my only way I could nurse them at the same time. So even if I'm going for a walk in the park, I am bringing a mm. giant twin nursing pillow with me. Mm. <laughs> and I remember like pushing this twin stroller that held the twin nursing pillow. And then I'm wearing both babies in slings because they would cry in the stroller. They wouldn't go in the stroller. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I'm like, so it's just for the pillow. The stroller yeah, is I'm just like for pushing the a stroller with a pillow <laughs> and holding two babies and like trying to push the stroller one handed. And oh, such a mess. Oh, man. Wow. And I had a lot of days of being like, I cannot do this anymore. I am quitting tomorrow. Uh huh. <laughs> a lot of days. Like my, yeah. my goals of how long I was going to nurse. At the beginning, I was like, I'm going to nurse them for two years. Like, that's what the World Health Organization says. And then it like went down and down and down and down (laughs) to where it was like, I can nurse them today. Uh That was like all I was asking of myself. Yeah. I I wanted to quit and I also didn't want to quit. You know, I, it was like, I would try to imagine what would that feel like to not be nursing and it would make me cry. So I was like, well, I guess I'm just going to keep nursing. Like, Yeah. I can do this for one more day. I can do this for one more day. I think, you know, people use that strategy in labor too. Of Like, it's just one contraction. Right. It's not hours of these contractions. And so that that was definitely a strategy I was using. I really didn't know how it was going to turn out, but. So was there ever a point when it felt a little easier when you weren't struggling or did it feel like struggle for the entire time that you nursed them? Oh, certainly not the entire time. No, there was a huge shift around six months. Okay. Which, you know, six months is a long time. That is a long time. To, that to is feel, a long ass time. I wouldn't yeah. say it felt like every feed was horrible for the whole six months, 
but it never felt great for six months. And it felt like my breasts were so much a focus on my life. And like, if I did go for a walk, I'm going to get a clogged duct. Like every, like they were just a filter for everything. I now know in retrospect that one of my babies had a tongue tie. Yeah. I was going to ask if you had any clinical understanding of what was happening. Yeah. Yeah. So, and I think it just made the, maybe they both did. One of them for sure did. And I was switching sides, you know, each feed. So I think maybe it would have been better not to like, it was just like, he was messing up both breasts. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, But they had to nurse really a lot to get enough milk and they did, but it wasn't like they acted satisfied. (laughs) You know, they were gaining well, but they were hungry. I see videos of them now and I'm like, why aren't I feeding them? And then I remember like, because I was feeding them all the time. Like this is me taking a tiny break and letting them suck my fingers, but like, obviously they're hungry. And then yeah, around six months it shifted. And I don't know at the time I thought it was that I had finally kicked the thrush. Maybe it was just that their mouths got big enough to where mm-hmm. the tongue tie wasn't really an issue anymore. Mm-hmm. But from that point on, it was pain-free. And it was like the promised land. <laughs> like mm-hmm. I didn't know that that time would come. And I felt like if only I had known this would come, like I would have for sure been able to manage it. Like, yeah. I just didn't know it existed, like that it could feel so fine. And then, and then I really loved breastfeeding. So mm-hmm. much. And at that point, you know, I wasn't tandem nursing them anymore. They were so efficient. I could just do one after the other and I could nurse everywhere. Um, and it was, it was great. I loved it. I couldn't believe it then that all my friends were like starting to talk about weeding, you know, because our babies were getting close to a year. And I was like, I finally figured this out. Like, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Six months feels like a really long time when you're in it. Yeah. But in retrospect, it's not like you're saying, <laughs> if you're looking back and you know that it's quote unquote only going to be six months and you know it will end, then you can endure a lot for six months. But the problem is if you don't know if it will end or not in six months and you're not able to figure out why the difficulty is happening for so long. Then, you know, that's when you start to maybe plan B, plan C, because, yeah, you don't really know if there is going to be an end to the difficulty. Um, But the fact that you were giving yourself the option to quit tomorrow if you needed to (laughs) was great. Absolutely. You know, like, and then you were really reevaluating. No, I can't imagine a world without breastfeeding, even though it was really hard. Yeah. And something and then, I tell people all the time is we do hard things all the time. And it's like people think because it comes to breastfeeding, if it's hard, we shouldn't do it. But mm-hmm. if I'm pursuing a career goal or pursuing an educational goal, when it's hard and we complain about it being hard, people don't tell us, well, you should just quit. They say oh man, I know, but you're doing such a good job and you're going to get there and how can I help you? But when it comes to something like breastfeeding or labor or childbirth or anything having to do with our children, it seems like mothering tasks, nurturing Mm -hmm. tasks, then often the answer is, well, then why are you doing that? Yeah. And sometimes the answer is to make a different plan. I'm not saying that right. people should never oh, yes. make a different plan. Of course. But uh, sometimes things are hard and it doesn't mean that we don't still want to accomplish that goal. Yeah. And and I think um, uh, I started going to La Leche League meetings mm. when the twins were like eight weeks old. And, and the reason I went wasn't because I had heard anything great about La Leche League. In fact, my mother had like warned me against it. (laughs) She was like, it's a cult, don't go. Uh, But I went because I had met this mom online through the Mothering Magazine thing, who also was a lesbian mom who lived in Northampton where I lived and had twins who she was breastfeeding. And her twins were like a year older than mine. And she was like, you have to come to La Leche League. It's so great. And so I went really to meet up with her. But that is what... um, 
hooked me in and to all the reasons why, um, why to keep doing this hard work. All, you know, because that wasn't something I had really considered. Um, there was so much I didn't know about like what was cool about human milk. And I still am a big advocate for like, it's not about the milk for me. I, I know for some families it absolutely is about the milk, um, but for me it, it really wasn't. It was it was about the experience of mothering through breastfeeding, and so that was a big you know in in my dark moments when I'd think about quitting, I'd be like, oh, then I can't go to La Leche League anymore, and that's like, so <laughs> fun, and so that you know it would keep me going. Also, when I had all what I thought was thrush, and maybe was thrush. <laughs> you know, I read like, you can wean and you're still going to have it. Like, that's not going to cure it. So that also kept me going. I was like, I don't want to be in this amount of pain and I'm not even nursing anymore. Like, and I didn't have a pump. Like, I know you can't just stop. So there were definitely roadblocks to stopping (laughs) too. Yeah. That that were in retrospect, probably helpful because um, of how much I ended up loving it. Mm -hmm. Enough to make a career out of it. I think by the time the twins were nine months old is when I was like, I want to be a lactation consultant when I grow up. Mm. Um, and I decided uh, the first thing I would do would be to become a La Leche League leader, which at the time was a pathway to becoming a lactation consultant. Um, so I started that process right around the twins' first birthday. I ended up nursing the twins until they were between two and three. And... The second year was hard in different ways. Um, I think that second half of the first year was my best time of nursing them. And then they, you know, toddlers are just hard and I, they were my first babies. And, and it was hard for me to evolve like from you have a baby who is hungry and wants to nurse and of course you're going to nurse them. And then you have an 18 month old who wants to nurse and the response could be different. Like, maybe this isn't the right moment. Maybe I'm in the middle of something. Maybe you're going to have to wait. But that was hard for me to learn. So I felt mm-hmm. very like, my body is not my body. The twins are like fighting over my body. One of them would, you know, fall down and get hurt. And the other one would run to me and ask to nurse because he <laughs> knew. Like, I was about to nurse his brother. So he's like, I asked first, you know, that kind of a thing. <laughs> Uh, so ridiculous. That's funny. Yeah. They also, oh, a, a funny, cute thing they would do is that they would both be nursing and then they would like pop off and look at each other and they'd be like, let's switch sides. Like, nah. <laughs> like maybe it's better over there. <laughs> um, oh, that's yeah. funny. It was really funny. So when they were two, about two and a half, I my, threw out my back and I couldn't nurse them for a few days less like cold turkey, could not nurse them because I was in so much pain. Mm. And it turned out like life felt a lot easier, especially for my wife. Like they were just, I think I realized in that moment, like there had been a lot of butting heads about nursing because they just wanted Mm. to nurse all the time. Like they were the kind of kids who in any situation where they didn't feel comfortable, they would just want to nurse. So we'd like go to the park and they'd be like, let's just sit here and nurse. And Mm -hmm. as a first time mom, it was hard for me to know how to set limits around that. Yeah. I improved with time. That's why I have so many children. (laughs) Yeah. Right. Right. You had to keep practicing. (laughs) I did. Yeah. So I had trouble setting limits. life. (laughs) Wow. Right. These stories are incredible. And I love that Lex knew that she did not have to stick to her goal of breastfeeding for two years, but that she could change her mind and decide day by day. Do you know what could have made Lex's life a little bit easier? Is something like Feast and Fettle. If you are looking for a way to just take one more thing off your plate, you can use my code MILK and go to feastandfettle.com to get $30 off your first week of home-cooked meals delivered right to your door. And with that, if you would like to meet Lex and discuss her twin feeding stories and learn about her as a professional and what she thinks about various barriers that we have discussed, you can join my Milk Making Minutes community group. She's in there. So join us there on Facebook. See you there. Bye. Bye.